So Luke chapter 24, verses 33 to 53. And it's there that we uh, pick up this story. And they rose that same hour, those are the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were gathered there together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending you the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is God's word. Thanks be to God for it. Well, last week, as you probably know, was Easter. And it's a time when Christians specifically gather to, gel- to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But this morning, I want to look at what happens in the lives of the disciples after the initial resurrection appearances of Jesus, because I think there is something very important for us to ponder. You see, Even though Christ has risen from the dead and has appeared to several of his disciples, and even though the disciples are saying to one another, it's true, he's alive, he appeared to Simon, the reality of Christ's resurrection has not yet changed the way that they experience life. In our text, the resurrected Jesus appears to his disciples and says to them, peace to you. Meaning that the event that the disciples are experiencing in their lives at this very moment is the resurrected Jesus appearing to them specifically in order to bring them peace. But they experience the exact opposite of peace. They are startled and they're frightened. Why? Because even though they know about the resurrection, they are not letting it reshape and reinterpret the way that they experience life. The situations that the disciples are in may be similar to the ones that we find ourselves in as we come together after Easter. We celebrate Easter. We believe in the resurrection of the dead as the creed states, but it's not yet a transforming truth that reshapes the entire outlook and experience of our life. And so what we're going to do this morning is attempt to strengthen our faith and certainty in the resurrection of Jesus so that we let it have operating sway over our entire lives. To do that, we're going to do three things. First, we are going to talk about the magnificence of the resurrection. Second, we're going to talk about the merit of the resurrection. And then third, we are going to talk about the mystery of the resurrection. 3M, not the trademark, magnificence, merit, and mystery. Starting with the magnificence of the resurrection. Now, some of you here this morning may be Christians, or you may may not be. Some of you may have been dragged to church, by a friend, or your parents said that as long as you are under my roof, you go to church. Maybe you're back after a long hiatus. Whatever the situation, I have found that many of us, myself included, don't bother determining the truth of something like the resurrection unless we first desire it to be true. Like, for example, if I said to you, good news, the government is giving out free root canals. Most of us are like, thanks, but I'm not really interested 
in knowing the details about how to get one of those because I don't really want a root canal. It's not something I desire. But if a root canal could drastically transform the way that you experience life, you'd be like, absolutely, give me the details about how do I get these free root canals. What this means for us this morning is that we need to preach a little bit from the back to the front. What that means is I'm not going to start with talking about the merit of the resurrection. In other words, like why we believe it to be true. First, I'm going to start talking about the magnificence of the resurrection. If it were true, this is what it would mean for our lives and this is how it would impact us. So that we hopefully see some of what it offers to us before we're like, I actually want that to be true. Is it true? Let's talk about the merit of it. Make sense? Yeah? So Jesus responds in our text to the fear of his disciples by getting them to zero in on what exactly it is that they are afraid of so that he can begin to address their fears. In verse 38 of our text, he says this, Jesus said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? So the first of Jesus' twofold diagnostic question to his anxious disciples is this, why are you troubled? The disciples are all huddled together at the moment. They are likely hiding from the authorities for fear that they may end up like Jesus on a cross. They have probably thought that they have ruined their lives up to this point. They've burned all their bridges with the communities that they grew up in and their future looks pretty dismal. Now on top of this whole situation comes spiritual oppression. Because all of a sudden a ghost appears in their midst and they're panicked about what's going to happen to them. Now, whatever it is, it's clear that they may say the resurrection is true, but they're not experiencing the truth of it in this moment. Because the one thing that can answer and is the calm to all of their fears is standing right in front of them, the resurrected Jesus, but they are reaping none of the benefit. So first of all, (coughs) to still their fear of death, the resurrected Jesus is proof that there is indeed a future beyond death. Now, similar to our culture, there were people at the time and numerous people who did not believe in an afterlife. Epicurus said death was non-existence. The Sadducees, they said there was no resurrection at the end of time. How many people, despite their ultimate belief of our existence, seeming to continue to ignore the fact that according to their own self-adhered to tenets, they are nothing more than a collection of random molecules? The Big Bang... Natural selection and evolution all point to randomness in the universe and that only material matter exists. But yet we live our lives as if there is more to us than just ashes to ashes and dust to dust. I've been at several funerals over the years, I've officiated several funerals over the years, where the prevailing professed belief system was this, human naturalistic evolution. It was that. But in the face of death, I was floored by the fact that so many people, so many of the grievers smuggled in beliefs about an afterlife from another belief system to help them cope with what they were going through. Few of them truly let the reality of non-existence after death hold sway in those moments. It's like we were hardwired to believe there is more to us than just decaying matter, but the secular worldview does not account for this. But the resurrection of Jesus is proof of life beyond the grave. Second, in response to Jesus' disciples' likely fear about what might happen to them and to each other, the resurrected Jesus is proof that life beyond the grave is personal. In other religions, hope beyond life is that we either find some type of consolation for all of our troubles or that we somehow return to the energy or the life force of the universe, like nirvana or reincarnation. But either way, in death, you lose the personal elements of life, especially relationships. But for most people in our society, they would say that the things that they hold most dear or the things that bring the most meaning into their lives are love and relationships. But death apart from the resurrection, is the stripping away of those people forever. You will never see them again. In fact, they cease to exist, or if they exist, they exist in such a way that their individuality is completely gone. Only the resurrection of Jesus stands as a testament that life beyond the grave is 
personal. Jesus shows up to his disciples and says, it's me. Look at my wounds. Feel my flesh. It is not a ghost or another person come back from the dead. It is not someone who does not remember life or doesn't remember who his disciples are. It's Jesus himself. And Jesus picks up with his disciples right where he left off with them because he knows them. Just let that percolate for a moment. You are going to be you forever. You are a self for eternity. Now this is a wondrous truth that cuts both ways. Because if you are a person that dislikes yourself, then you are stuck with you for a very, very, very long time. And we need to let the reality of the resurrection bring reconciliation to our inner person. You may not like you, but God liked you enough to resurrect you into eternity that he could spend time enjoying you and you enjoying him. But not only will we be selves forever, it also means that the people that we love will also be selves forever. Think about it like this. Several of you probably had a family dinner of some kind at Easter or at some of the major holidays. And I want you to let that Easter dinner be a marker for you. If I think back to my childhood and my Easter celebrations and sitting around that big table eating turkey, there are very clearly several people that were there in my childhood that are no longer there. I've lost all four grandparents and I've lost an aunt to cancer. This Easter, as I sat around the table and I looked at the faces of everybody sitting there attending that Easter dinner, I was also, the joy of that was tainted by the reality that that one of the people there will have to attend the funeral of every single other person sitting at that table. One person, the he or she that's there, will have to lower us all into the ground and say goodbye to every single one of us, one by one by one. Only the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the antidote to the poison of death, tainting all of the joy that you experience in life. Because every relationship you experience, the joy of those moments, has to be tainted by the reality flooding in that one day it will be taken from you. One day it will be gone. One day you will not be able to embrace this person anymore. You will not be able to laugh. You won't be able to pass them turkey and ask if they want cranberries because nobody ever wants cranberries. Why is it there? But only the resurrection of Jesus is the antidote to that tainting all of our joy. In the face of the disciples' fear and sorrow, Jesus doesn't offer them a consolation prize for all of their troubles. He offers them life restored with each other and him, actual endless love. Third, third all of us, this doesn't do us any good in the present if we're not certain we can receive it. In other words, if you're not certain that this is your hope and your future, you're not going to be able to start reaping the benefits of it in the here and now. But listen to how many times in the chapter Jesus has to remind his disciples that all of this was according to God's plan. For most of them, they thought that Jesus' suffering and death proved that he could not be God's rescue agent to restore them because that was the exact, but that was the exact opposite. It was because he was taking on their garbage and the garbage of the world that he could indeed be God's rescue agent and redeem them. In verses 46 to 48 of our text, it says this, this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. In order for forgiveness of sins to be preached, God needed to make a payment. And if that payment is made, then there is nothing left for you and I to pay. It would be unjust of God to demand double. If he poured all of our sin upon Jesus Christ, it would be unjust for him to look at us and say, you need to pay for that too. Because Jesus already poured it all out. When Jesus cries, it is finished on the cross, it's because he meant what he said. It is indeed finished. Think about it like this. The only person receiving credit on judgment day is Jesus. You and I are not going to receive an, a, an ounce of credit. We worry about whether we are enough. The answer is you're not enough. Jesus is enough and you are in him. Our future is certain because it's guaranteed. It's already been paid for. And if we are in Christ, 
then it is ours and we can begin to reap the benefit from it in the here and now. There's nothing left that you need to do to pay for it. It is yours. All you need to do is receive it and enjoy it. Finally, for this morning, and every stone that I'm unturning, there's probably three more that we could, but we're limited time. Our future is not only certain, I would say our future is also bright. As I age in this life, I realize that it is not just death taking people away from us that we mourn, but we also mourn the passing of life. I know there are things that I will never get to do again. I know there are moments that I will never get back. Those summer vacations, camping with family, and sleeping with my friends in the same tent for the first time. Away from our parents, huddled in our own little tent. This is cool, it's us. That's never gonna happen again. College sports, they are a distant memory for me. It's gone, my body is decaying just like my eyesight. Those tender years with my kids, they're here now, but they are quickly going to disappear. Soon they may be off at college or getting married or having kids of their own. But not only are there things that I experience that I will never get to experience again, there are things that I will never have the chance to experience. The moment for them is irretrievably gone. Perhaps because of your commitment to God-honoring sexuality, you know that you will never have a spouse. Or because you follow God with your finances, you have sacrificed your retirement travel plans. Or the time is too late for you to have a child. Whatever it is, we realize that as we get older, life gets stripped away from us. Both what we had and we can't get back, but also opportunities to experience something we've never experienced. But the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the declaration that you will miss nothing. You will miss nothing. Think of it. If all of the good stuff that you enjoyed in this life, Christ came to redeem and he is going to restore into a future state, you miss none of the good stuff. All of the good stuff is restored to you. Everything you have surrendered for his sake, you will receive in far better form. There will be a wedding supper for you and you will get to experience the best spouse. You will travel the world, but you will travel the world when it's restored to its former glory. You will get your body back, only it will be the body you always wanted but never had. The disciples bemoaned that they had hoped that Jesus was going to be the one who would restore Israel and the dream of God for his people would finally come true, but now their hopes were dashed. But the resurrection is evidence that their hopes will be realized. Israel will be restored. The dream for God's people and the dream for God's world is all back on track because of what Jesus did on the cross and rose from the dead. We will get to experience it all. And I think if you dig down deep in your heart, and there's more that we could excavate there, you will realize that this is what you truly long for. But only the resurrection offers it. Only the gospel is truly good news to the suffering, the hurting, the dying, the ones who are having their homes in this life destroyed, their dreams shattered, and their loved ones stripped away from them in the most dismal conditions. Only this gospel is a gospel of resurrection. It is a gospel of restoration. It is a gospel of true hope beyond the grave, not losing our individuality or the people we know, but all of that restored with none of the bad stuff in it but it is only gospel to the aching human soul if it actually happened. So let's talk about the merit of the resurrection. The second part of Jesus' twofold question to his anxious disciples is this, why do doubts rise in your minds? They are doubting that it is actually him and that the resurrection actually happened. I don't think it's too far of a stretch for us to see ourselves in their shoes. But our text offers us several ways to strengthen our confidence in the authenticity of the resurrection. But first, we need to understand the type of proof that we are looking for to determine the historicity of a given event. Historicity means the actual historical, did it happen and can we believe it happened? Now in my undergrad, one of the courses that I had to take as a history major was philosophy of history. In other words, why do we study history and how do we study history? And I remember that the first few lectures of this class were dedicated to showing us that we cannot actually prove something in history happened to study it. Now that sounds strange to think about, 
but it means that if we seek to prove an event in history the same way that we seek to prove that water boils at 100 degrees, we're going to be left wanting because it's impossible. You cannot demonstrate that the French Revolution actually took place because the event is gone and it cannot be reduplicated like you reduplicate the boiling of water. And so all that we have is the residue of that event left in history. We have, all we have is secondhand knowledge from witnesses that we need to determine whether or not we can trust, and then archaeological evidence that we need to compose a reasonable theory from. Does that make sense? Yeah, sort of, yeah. I'll try. In the Lord of the Rings, There are several battles that happened. And in the movies, what they do in The Lord of the Rings is often they show what's happening in the battle from the perspective of one individual, right? So they show it from the hobbits throughout all of the battle. And they see, you see flashes of Aragorn going here and Gandalf's doing this. And you're like, what's going on? And then all of a sudden they move over to Gandalf's perspective and they trace him through it. And then they move over to Aragorn's perspective and they trace him through it. And through the different witnesses of the event, you come to a compilation of this is actually all that's going on rather than just a single perspective. So when we talk about studying history, that's kind of the way that we need to see it. The event happened and you have witnesses of this event in history that either write an account, but they're only witnessing one perspective, right? And so you need to move around this perspective and have several different witnesses to try and get at the actuality of this is probably what's going on. All witnesses are biased and that kind of stuff. And you need to trust or gauge whether or not you can trust the sources and trust their perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah, you guys are all gonna go home and watch The Lord of the Rings now. Yeah. So what this means for us is if we're going to support the reality of the resurrection, we need to ask, does it have good historical evidence? But on the flip side, if we're going to deny the reality of the resurrection, we need to come up with an alternative reasonable theory that makes sense of the data. And coming up with an alternative reasonable theory presents more of a challenge than you might first expect. So let's start somewhere that everybody agrees. And that is that somehow we need to account for the fact that something unique happened in the first three centuries AD in the Roman Empire. A previously unknown religion that started in a tiny obscure town, perpetuated mostly by uneducated fishermen, tax collectors, and Jewish fundamentalists, became the dominant religion of a previously hostile empire and supplanted a culture of one of the most sophisticated societies that the earth has ever seen. And it did this not through military conquest, but through personal testimony and martyrdom. Luke 47 to 48 says this, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name, that's Jesus' name, to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. What Jesus says here is exactly what happened, written even before it happened. No mass media marketing campaigns, no propaganda machine to perpetuate it. Just suddenly, in the blink of an eye, on the pages of history, a collection of random witnesses started to proclaim an event that had no prior precedence. Meaning there was nothing in Greco-Roman or Jewish religion that said there would be the resurrection of one person in the middle of history. N.T. Wright, biblical scholar, puts it like this. He says this, any first century historian should recognize that whatever it was that the early Christians were expecting, wanting, hoping, and praying for, this was not what they said after Easter had happened. Something had happened, something which was not at all what they expected or hoped for, something around which they had to reconstruct their lives. So N.G. Wright basically says, if we look at all their hopes prior to this moment, none of them are actually what they eventually said had happened. But when we talk about witnesses, we also need to talk about the Bible. It could be argued that the Bible itself is one long book witnessing to the reality of Jesus Christ. It witnesses by both predicting Jesus' death and resurrection and then testifying to the reality of that death and resurrection. Luke 24, 44 to 46 puts it like this. Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Now, if you read all of chapter 24, 
Luke spills a lot of ink in the chapter to tell us that everything that happened to Jesus was planned and predicted. He does it four times. Through the mouths of the angels, the disciples on the road recounting the events, Jesus incognito explaining the events and the scriptures, and now here again later in the chapter. Now it's one thing if you're going to tick off a few predictions here and there if you're faking it till you make it. But the sheer quantity of scriptures fulfilled in Jesus is staggering. And numerous ones that he had absolutely no control over, like the circumstances and the place of his birth. How do you, how do you work that one if you're a con artist? But all of this is based on the fact that the New Testament witnesses are reliable. Many don't believe in Jesus because they think the Bible is made up. But the trouble with writing off the New Testament accounts is the fact that there is a lot of manuscripts. Manuscripts is just a word that means original historical document that are really, really close to the time and the events that they describe, and they all say the same thing. Meaning that what we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is old. It is old enough to be written while the people who witnessed those events they described have still been alive. We don't just have one or two, but we have thousands, and they all say the same thing. Now, right now, we're not talking about what they say. We're just talking about what the documents themselves. And both Christians and non-Christian scholars say, yes, these are authentic from the time period. Yes, we have a lot of copies. And yes, there is very good harmony between the copies. So if you want to write off the resurrection, you need to somehow explain why we have this massive corpus of authentic historical documents. Now, it's one thing that to say that we have these massive corpus of documents, but it's another thing to marvel at what they say. Now, we've often been told, and I've heard it flung around to me as well, that there were other accounts of what happened floating around at the time, and the church just randomly picked these four to stick it into the canon. The problem is that that's not the case. And I would urge you to go track one of these false accounts and read it because it will not take too long before as you're reading it you will realize that there's something very different about it compared to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They read like very poorly written fantasy novels that lack narrative detail because that's how people wrote made up stories back in the day. We pick up a fantasy novel and we read it and there's all kinds of details plugged in there because that's how we learn to write. If you read accounts from back in the day like Homer's Odyssey or that kind of stuff. They don't. There's no narrative detail. It's just boom, 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 boom. So if you're making up a story, that's the way that you write. But the Gospels don't read like this. The Gospels are full of historical detail, recounting actual historical events. They tell us towns and location. These guys were on the way to Emmaus and they ran all the way back to Jerusalem. They tell us names of people who told the story. Why does Luke tell, I think it's Luke that tells us, that the sons of Simon and si- of Cyrene are Rufus and Alexander? Because if you want to know if Simon and Cyrene actually carried the cross, go find Rufus and Alexander because they're still in the community and they will testify to the reality of the tale. It's like an ancient footnote put in the text. And they locate it all in the timeline of history. This was who was empire, emperor at the time, this is who was king, and this is who was governor. So do you know that these are actual historical dents with actual historical details? Why is it a fish? that they ask. Do you have any fish? Because that's what the witnesses remember, and that's when they tell the tale. That's how they tell it. And one of the details of our text that's important for us to point out is how many people are present at this event. You see, it's one thing for Simon and the other two disciples to maybe uh, make up a story about hallucinating or seeing Jesus, but it's another to have a large group of people all testify to the reality of the same thing, but that's what we have in our text. In verse 33, it says that those disciples got up at once and they returned to Jerusalem and there they found the eleven and all those with them assembled together. Conspiracies about supernatural phenomenon are best to avoid large crowds, lest someone accidentally see behind the curtain. But here we have Jesus appearing to a group of people. One scholar, Peter Williams, compiled a list of Jesus' appearances and it's a little bit tough to dissect, but I I just love it so I'm going to read it to you. The resurrected Jesus is recorded as appearing in Judea and in Galilee, in town and the countryside, 
indoors and out of doors, in the morning and in the evening, by prior appointment and without prior appointment, close and distant, on a hill and by the lake, to a group of men, to groups of women, to individuals, and groups of up to 500, sitting, standing, walking, eating, and always talking. Many are explicitly close encounters involving conversations. It's hard to imagine this pattern of appearances recorded in the gospel as early Christian letters without there having been multiple individuals who claim to have seen the risen Christ from the dead. Jesus doesn't also seem to be limited by walls or physical space. He appears and then he disappears, which would lead us to think he's a ghost-like figure that's more phantom than person. But then, just as we and the disciples are probably thinking that that, Jesus tells us to touch him. Verse 39 and 40. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. We need to think about trying to spin this fairy tale. Like imagine the discussion. Okay, let's have Jesus appear in all kinds of different places, back to back to back to back to all kinds of different people and groups of people, even overlapping with some people seeing him twice in one day. Because that's going to be very easy to collaborate. We see in crime dramas how hard it is to get two or three witnesses to collaborate on their made-up stories, let alone hundreds and thousands of witnesses. And then, to have all of those witnesses describe the same weird phenomenon that has no prerequisite. You see, the Bible describes heavenly figures but they're always in dazzling white or glowing. But Jesus here is very ordinary. It also describes ghostly figures, like when Saul conjures up the spirit of Samuel. So if the disciples are going to make something up, they would have likely grabbed from one of these Jewish Jewish sources, but instead they come up with something entirely other. Jesus is not spirit, but he's also just not a resuscitated corpse like Lazarus. Remember, this is the second person that's come back from the dead that the disciples have witnessed. Jesus is something entirely different, though. Lazarus didn't walk through walls. He didn't whatever. Jesus here is transphysical, or he is supraphysical, meaning that he is not less physical in a way that a ghost is, but he is more substantive than our physical reality. So as ghostly is to us, our physical reality is to him. As you walk through a ghost, because you are more substantive to it, we need to think about our physical reality being that ghostly, and Jesus is more substantive to it. C.S. Lewis, for those of you fans here, in his uh, book, The Great Divorce, pictures it like this. We come from the shadow lands, and as we move towards heaven, we become more solid people, more substantive. Jesus is more solid than our reality, not less. He is more solid because he is the only one in his eternal future form while all of the rest of humanity is in shadow, so to speak, fading away. For the disciples to make this up is a hard, hard sell. Tracking with me? This brings us to the final thing this morning, and that is the mystery of the resurrection. Now, the word mystery is used a couple of times in the Bible, but it is not used the way that many of us use it. A mystery is not something unknowable, but rather it is something unknown until revealed. So similar to a Sherlock Holmes novel, it is a mystery until Sherlock unravels it and then all is revealed. The mystery of the resurrection is that no one anticipated that it was God's plan until it was revealed that it was God's plan. And it is my hope this morning that perhaps for you a little bit of the mystery of the resurrection is unveiled or it's revealed. That you see a glimpse of the wondrous mystery of God's redemption, but still maybe you tread forward with trepidation. And that's why I want to end on this final point for both you and us. We need to see how Jesus deals with the disciples' skepticism. Often we imagine God to be scowling at us as we struggle towards belief. Or the pounding waves of doubt are compounded by God's stern look at us to just demand faith. But is that the Jesus that you see in our text? Forget what you imagine, forget what your culture has told you, and look at him here in this moment. Even after Jesus says it's him, nobody believes him. There is not a non-skeptic in the bunch. They don't want to believe it's true, and only when Jesus demonstrably proves to them that it's him do they even start to believe. 
Only after he lets them see his wounds and put their hands in his side and he eats some fish and it doesn't fall out of his side, but it stays in his, in his belly. Like if you're trying to sell a tale to the world, these are not the kinds of details you want to include to make it sound airtight. That all of the first witnesses don't believe and they don't want to believe and only they believe after they have no other choice. Perhaps, but perhaps the most truly amazing thing is that Jesus endures it all in order that they may believe. He doesn't respond to their skepticism with a hard line for them to just take his word at it. It was testified into the scriptures for thousands of years. Why are you guys so slow? But he invites them to take a closer look. He stands there. He stands in the middle of this group of people. And he says, touch me. Come up and touch me. Feel me. Here's my hands. Here's my feet. Stare into my eyes. Pull at my beard. Expe- inspect my wounds. He understands that what's happened is hard to believe, and so he says, have a closer look. I'll endure it. And to us, he says the same. Come have a closer look. And he's not scowling as you struggle towards belief. He's sitting there enduring it. Have a look at it. Airtight. Feel me. I'm real. I actually did come to rescue you, and I want you to believe. But once you realize that it's true, There is nothing else left to do but worship. Flannery O'Connor wrote a little short story called The Misfit, and there's this scene in it that I love. The Misfit is a criminal, and he is robbing this family, this good Christian family at the side of the road. And as he's doing it, the grandmother who's there says something about Jesus. And the Misfit goes, Jesus? Well, Jesus thrown the whole thing off balance. If he did what he said he did, then there's nothing for you and I to do but throw away everything and follow him. And if he didn't, then it's nothing for you and I to do but enjoy the few minutes you got left the best way that you can. Only worship transforms you. You will follow after and create time for whatever it is that your heart loves. And only when you see Jesus as God come to rescue you does your life transform. Our skepticism turns to worship, our terror to joy, and our timidity into boldness. Luke tells us in verse 51 and 53 of our text, while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually in the temple praising God. We need to remember that the Jews were staunch monotheists who knew that you were only to worship God. They were the last people on the planet who would ever bow down to a man. And many people in their history were killed because they refused to bow down to a man. So for these disciples to suddenly fall down and worship Jesus means that the entire way that they understood God, life, death, had been utterly shattered and rebuilt. They didn't start to worship Lazarus when he rose from the dead because he was just a resuscitated man. Lazarus came back from the dead. Jesus passed through death to the other side. He blew a hole out the backside so that he could take other people with him. He was God incarnate, come to rescue you. Something had completely altered the way that the disciples thought about God and they can't contain it. They're suddenly found in the temple praising God. Something has dealt with their fear to such a degree that they're now risking exposure to the local authorities for the sake of going public with what they have seen heard and touched. We make a lot of excuses for ourselves for why we don't tell other people about Jesus. I know that I do, but maybe deep down it's simply because I'm not that yet impacted by what he has done, or I don't really see the true beauty of it, and it's not percolated through the rest of my life. He doesn't even commission them in the passage. He just says, you are witnesses. You're going to be. You can't help it once you realize what's happened to me. You're going to tell everybody about these things because your joy cannot be held in. So hopefully this morning we see a little bit of the magnificence of the resurrection. We understand that it's got good historical merit, but mostly that we see that our God loves us so much that he wouldn't just do all of that, but he endures our skepticism. He says, come to me, touch my hands, touch my feet, that you may believe and have life and life to the full. And all God's people said, amen. Let's pray.